change, that this family could probably survive. They even had, they had well water. They could probably survive um, even without hardly any money. Okay, so that is what, and they did, they had some land too that they grew uh, food for themselves like rice and they also sold, right? So they did a combination like a lot of people do in India of su subsistence agriculture, which means growing things that just keep your family going, you can feed your family, and also market agriculture, selling some of their produce, right? So this is the type of farm, the type of rural living that I suspect G.K. Chesterton would recognize, okay? In India, whereas it used to occur even in his own native land, but here, even now in 2021, there's a lot of people in India that are living this way. 58% of Indians rely on subsistence farming plus some market farming. And prior to the development of industrial capitalism, the majority of the world's people, of course, relied upon subsistence farming. Um, now about 25% of the world's people rely on subsistence farming, many if not most of them in the global south. And that is being threatened by changes that are brought on by the globalized food system, the globalized food economy. So I don't know if any of you have heard about this phenomenon in India, but it's, it's huge. It's a huge ongoing protest of farmers. I mean, millions of farmers. Um, and I think it started in, uh, I wanna say September, or October of last year in big numbers. I think it had been going on before then as well, but it really started to swell at that time. And even to this day, there are thousands, if not more people outside of Delhi, um, farmers who are basically, you know, they're, they're living in tent cities um, and they have decided they are gonna stay there and they're not leaving until the government changes its laws because their subsistence market farming way of life is being threatened by these changes that Narendra Modi wants or has made, has pushed through these laws that have changed the, the way that they've been operating since the 1960s or so, okay? Now, before these changes, and still there's a lot of people owning small land, you know, small farms, but these changes have made it so that it's much more likely that these small farms are gonna, that many of the small ones are gonna go under and that they're going to be bought by larger farms and that farming is gonna become what, what we in the United States call conventional, although I find that to be a very odd term because it's actually not conventional. It's, it's you know, monoculture, agriculture, big, big, ag basically. So they're worried that they're going to lose their, their farms because these uh, old supports that the government has had in place for a long time to help these farmers out, Modi is taking away. Okay. Um, so the reason why I bring this up, if it's not, if it's not obvious already, is because the, these supports, the, the sort of contract that, that the Indian government had with with Indian farmers, it sustained a great distribution of a lot of small farms. It's, it's an element of distributism at work in India, right? And so what these farmers are protesting is the end of a, of a distributist model um, for farming. Distributism can't exist unless government is willing to support sectors like agriculture and to regulate it so that, so that people don't get bought out and overrun by larger interests, okay? Um, so Modi is a nationalist, um, which again is kind of like uh, ironic. He calls himself a nationalist and he is a nationalist in some ways, and yet he's not a nationalist at all when it comes to um, economics. 
um, because uh, you know he's following in the footsteps of the Reagan Thatcher, um, you know, deregulation mode, in which these people are just going to be they're going to be thrown into this competitive environment, in which uh, the ones that have like for instance access to high technology where they can market their goods through a computer. Um, are going to win out over over ones who don't, and so you can see how it would be wouldn't be very long before um, you know these these advantages bought with money would would basically squeeze the smaller farmers out. So they're under they would undergo the process that happened in the United States decades ago, right? That's that's what they're facing, and so they're very boldly out there. And some of these protests have gotten extremely violent. The government has responded with repression. They've attacked these people. Some of these people have been tortured. Um, it's been really, really ugly, and it's been going on a long time. Um, just a little blurb from CNN. I put several stories in the in the Slack uh, column having to do with current events. But um, it says under the previous laws, farmers had to sell their goods at auction at their state's agricultural produce market committee, where they were guaranteed to receive at least the government agreed minimum price. There were restrictions on who could buy and prices were capped for essential commodities. Three new laws initiated by the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi dismantled this committee structure, instead allowing farmers to sell their goods to anyone at any price. Okay, and that sounds really good. You're free to sell your goods to anyone at any price without price supports, but but I hope you can see how that favors the, the farmers, um, the owners with more property, more money, who are poised and ready to compete in that freewheeling market, right? Um, and who will then start to buy out these other farmers who then, what will they do? Go to Delhi and try to try to make a living? Um, yeah, I think, was there a question or a comment? I thought I saw something come up. No, no, I just was reposting your, your links to uh, everything again in case uh, anyone needed to get a hold of that. Um, while, while we're here, Lori, is it, is there efforts for collectivization underway, some sort of like a neo-populist um, effort within the, the ground swelling, or have they gone directly to um, just this, this pushback against changes? Are they, are they trying to find ways to make changes that they can control some of this? That's an excellent question. From what I've read, their primary uh, mode is still to demand the government make these changes and repeal these laws. Over and over again, they say, you need to just take back these laws. The farmers are important. They're a big part of the electorate. And you know this needs to be changed and you need to put back what was there before, which we could count on. As far as whether there's any kind of anarchistic um, you know, move to kind of just collectivize and help each other. I haven't seen that, but I haven't, I also haven't like read everything related to this. So I can't say for absolute sure that this hasn't been tried. I'd be surprised, but what, it doesn't get tried or at least discussed um, in these circles. I mean, basically these people have been camping out for months and months and months um, and this is generally where you go next if the government fails to respond to your demands, right? And these people are bold. These people are not like folks in the United States. I mean, sorry, I hope I'm not offending anybody, but like folks in the United States come out and they protest for a while and then they tend to go home, right? Um, and, you know, like things flare up and then flames die down. But gee whiz, I mean, they're determined. Like, you, you know, and, and it's interesting because the American media doesn't cover this very much. You don't hear about this on the nightly news, not, not as much as, as you should. It's phenomenal. So, but I mean, to answer your question, it seems like they're still saying, we want the system back that we had before. And Modi is basically trying to, you know, modernize India. He's trying to make India, um, like a lot of other countries, part of the global um, the international uh, food market. 
And so the emphasis is on, on like growing cash crops that you can store and sell abroad and um, that, that Indians need too. But like I read another story where, you know, especially the Indian farmers that deal with perishable produce as opposed to the kind that you can store up like the grains and stuff, they are in particularly a difficult situation, right? And, and a lot of the government programs even before didn't really apply to them, didn't really help them as much. Um, so India is kind of a test case that uh, is ongoing as to whether, uh, you know, some, some sort of distributist uh, way of production can survive in our modern world. And it, it raises an alarming question as to like what happens to in the Indian people if their if the protest efforts don't succeed don't succeed, because uh, the system that they've been living with for all those decades did keep them, you know, relatively better fed um, than before. I mean, it was actually you know, if nothing is perfect, but it was actually fairly uh, productive. Um, so, I mean, this is just a blurb about the tractor protest, but imagine a protest in which farmers bring their tractors and their oxen and all of these different things to this place. And basically they're being kept out of Delhi proper by these huge walls of of barbed wire that the government has put up to kind of contain them in one area. And they are not at all shy about bringing out the troops to suppress these folks when they get out of hand. So I really encourage all of you to um, check into this and learn more about it. But as it says there, they're demanding the repeal of laws passed by parliament in September that say they will favor large corporate farms, devastate the earnings of many farmers and leave those who hold small plots behind as big corporations went out. That's, that's happened long ago in the United States, right? And we tend to think that, well, it's just the march of progress. You know, that's just, that's just the way it had to be. And, and you know what? People can retool and do, do many other things. So it's all good, but man, when you've got almost 60% of your population feeding themselves and other people through uh, small diversified agriculture, you know, it's, it could cause a catastrophe to, if these changes unfold. It also um, just, I don't know, this is kind of tangential, but you lose a lot of the local uh, plant species when this process happens. You know, uh, plants plants and animals that more adapted to the climate without, without having to rely upon irrigation or um, particular pesticides and fertilizers just to survive. Some of the, some of the plant species that people um, farmed and, and relied on have literally gone extinct in India. You may not be able to recover, but you know, if, if something happens to the global market, they're gonna need to have that reliable source of food and it is now, but I would say that, you know, India is in a situation right now that's similar to what, well, you know, like maybe the, 19, the late 19th century, very early 20th century, right, in Europe, where there's still a memory, in fact, a practice of a lot of subsistence agriculture. And there is a intense um, understanding, a grasping of the threat to it posed by, by big agriculture. Um, and it's still conceivable at that point in time, it's still conceivable to, to stop or even reverse the process in a way that it's not conceivable for say us in the United States or in a lot of the Western world now at this point in time to be able to even conceive that it could be possible. Um, it, you know, the problem was very evident and Chesterton's big question in the outline of sanity was, could we get these people who lived in urban areas now who lived in these slums and in these high rises who worked in factories, 
in situations like that, were they, were, were they capable of returning to being, quote, peasants, okay? Uh, <laughs> that term is kind of loaded, like who wants to be a peasant, right? Um, but the way that Chesterton meant the term was simply the self-sustaining family, basically, the subsistence agriculture self-sustaining family. 